And I will tell you that every year we have a richer pool of speakers to draw from. And I think that this is our best program yet. And you will hear we have so many speakers talking about different aspects of innovation in the health sector. And one of the reasons we have this program adjacent to Capitol Hill is because we feel there is so much going on in the real health sector where real change is happening. And members of Congress really need to understand, and regulators in particular, really need to understand where innovation comes from. And it comes from you all. It comes from the health sector making a difference and figuring out what doctors and patients need to deliver care better, more efficiently, more economically, with new incentives for that, and also to to really bring the changes that will bring tomorrow's medical miracles to us. And we want to welcome everybody who's joining us, joining us on our webcast. Uh, it's being webcast, and you can access that through Galen, G-A-L-E-N, obviously, dot org. And we, uh, we welcome all of you who are joining us virtually for this conference today. You're missing out on the camaraderie and the good food, but we're glad to have you for the program. This is an interesting time in the health debate. I sort of feel like we're in a little bit of paralysis here as everybody is waiting for the Supreme Court decision and what we can um, expect with all of the various scenarios. But I believe no matter what happens, the forces of innovation will prevail. And we will, we want to get started right away with our first panel. I see Dr. Elmers, uh, Congresswoman Elmers has arrived. So may I invite our first panel to come, sp to come forward. We have uh, the first two panels and our keynote speaker and we'll just move from right one to another to maximize your time. And we will, um, so, be, feel free to walk back and refresh your coffee, and then we'll have a, a hard break, I think about 10.45, so we, um, at 11, 11 o'clock, so we um, allow you to just ease in and out of the, um, the coffee bar. So welcome to our first panel. We are delighted to have um, Congresswoman Renee Elmers. I'm gonna introduce everybody in, in order of their speaking. Um, I met Congresswoman Elmers when she was, it was a close match in the second district of North Carolina. And I met her right after the elections, before the election results have actually been certified. But it's just really delightful to, to have her here. She represents the um, second district of North Carolina. This is her first term. She's elected in 2010. She, and, uh, she is a registered nurse and has worked for 20 years with the Trinity Wound Care Center. And um, she and her husband, who's a surgeon, Dr. Brent Elmers, um, really just got terribly alarmed when they saw the changes and the lack of the loss of doctor-patient control over medical decisions that they saw coming through the health legislation that it was making its way through Congress. And she said, I gotta do something about this. And so she got, her, got elected to Congress and is making a huge difference and is one of the members of the Doctors' Caucus and um, members really do listen to those who have real experience in the medical profession. And it's just delightful to have you join us and we'll welcome you to the podium. Or if you'd like to stay, talk from there, that's fine too. Oh, that's fine. Uh, Either one. You think. Um, this feels good actually. Um, if, if you don't mind, uh, Grace, I would love to sit here. I um, just had my primary last night back in North Carolina, which I was able to win, but I have had very little sleep. Very little sleep. <laughs> So thank you. Um, it is very true. The reason I ran was um, as a result of the president's health care bill. And of course, the, one of the very first, if not the first vote we took in the House of Representatives was to repeal it. And of course, um, that going on to the Senate had really didn't move. Um, so we sit with it where, where we are. We are still very committed to, to repeal. Of course, it's sitting there for the Supreme Court. We'll, we'll know more next month um, what their decision is. Um, but absolutely, you know, with the, with the healthcare system the way that it is right now, it is 
stifling innovation. It is stifling um, research and development. For me in North Carolina, of course, that's that's key because of the healthcare system that we have there. Plus, we have the research uh, Triangle Park. We have we have much biotech, and all of these things are what we should be moving towards. Um, the costs are, are going up, and as many of you know, as physicians, um, you are seeing the result of the recession more at the, you started feeling it at the middle to the end. And the, I can say that knowing full well what our practice um, has experienced. So now is not the time to have some of these things being implemented, especially through Obamacare. One of the things that, um, that we, and I am a co-sponsor of, is H.R. 436. Uh, Protect Med Medical Innovation Act of 2011, which basically repeals the 2.3% medical device tax that will be part of the pay for for Obamacare. We feel very strongly about that. Obviously, you can you know the effects. I'm 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 kind of preaching to the choir here. Anytime we're adding greater cost, that's just going to make it more difficult. And again, cause you and those who, who would be investing in research and development and innovation to really hold on to what you have and not move forward. And that's the last thing we want to see in the country. Um, some of the other issues, um, I, I sit on the Small Business Committee in the House and I chair the Health and Technology Subcommittee. And this is one of those areas that, that we have looked at continuously. Um, one of the things that we were ab able to pass um, was the Small Business Innovation Research Grant, which, of course, initially was enacted in 1982, and we were able to tweak it up to today's standards by increasing some of the award monies. It's a wonderful um, grant. It's money that was already appropriated through each different committee. So it is no additional taxpayer cost, but it, it just makes it better. We've, we've been able to, to streamline the process a bit, and um, I'm very excited about that. It's a, it's a competitive process, and anyone um, who applies, can you can have venture capital backing. It's, it's not something that outside of venture capital um, you would be looked at, which I think is key because we want those individuals interested in you, not just trying to uh, find dollars somewhere else. Um, one of the key issues that, that we're in the midst of right now, we had sent over a letter to HHS um, about a week, week and a half ago, essentially asking, we've all become very familiar with the uh, term meaningful use. And that is not a well-defined description. And as you all know, meaningful use, depending on what type of practice you have, can mean many different things. And unfortunately, they've kind of come forward um, through Obamacare with kind of a, a, a straightforward, generalized model. And many of you are not able to apply for that. That just doesn't, that doesn't fit your type of practice. One of the things that we felt very strongly about were that some of the mandates that have been put in place directly affect, um, I feel, unfairly, those who are in smaller practices and those who are nearing the time of retirement. So any practice with five or fewer physicians should not be held to those mandates. Also, those who, and of course we had to come up with a number, I figured if, if we said 25 or 35, then they'd be looking at retirement as well. So uh, we said 60 years or older, if you're at that age range, um, you, you shouldn't have to adhere to those mandates as well. That's a lot of money that you would have to invest in your practice that, that is needless. And we've had a lot of positive feedback from that. However, we have not had a response um, from HHS yet, but they have, they have more time. Um, usually it's about a 60-day um, time limit. But we hear what I, the very good positive message that I want to give you is that there are more of us in Washington now in Congress with health care experience. I am one of three nurses that were elect, um, elected in the 2010, um, Anne-Marie Burkle from New York, and um, 
My good friend, Diane Black from Tennessee, was elected. We have more physicians. We, are all, we all participate with the Doctors' Caucus, and we're always working on these issues. We are ready to put replacements in. We, we've listened to the ideas that are out there in both healthcare insurance and in the healthcare field to make the, the process better. We've all known in healthcare that there are many reforms that need to be put in place. What this has done is put it as a national discussion rather than just those of us in healthcare. So I feel very good about the future. It's going to take a while to get, you know, it's not going to be perfect right away, but we're going to get there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Mel Elmers. Um, what we're going to do is, um, is each one of the panelists is going to speak and then we'll take your questions at the end and um, move on to our next panelist. And we're delighted to have Joe Quinn return as a panelist. He spoke at our, our first conference in 2009. Um, he's Senior Director of Issue Management and Strategic Outreach for Walmart Corporate Affairs. And Joe is uh, in charge of the decisions that the company makes and helping the, the company navigate the shoals of health reform and many other issues as well. When Joe spoke to us uh, several years ago, he talked about Walmart's $4 prescription drug plan for generic drugs, and that was truly a transformative idea that, that led the industry to, to move toward affordable prescription drugs. Not only did Joe win the award, the 2007 uh, co-winner for the uh, Walt, Sam M. Walton Entrepreneurial Award, but he has saved Americans at least $2.5 billion. And physicians have told me this is the single most transformative public health initiative in their career. So we're really delighted to have Joe join us. Uh, Walmart employs 1.4 million people and a million people on the health benefits plan, so Walmart comes to us with great expertise on many levels. So, Joe, welcome. I can't see the slides. Don't mind if I... Well, yeah, and you want to... Can I stand? Yeah, fine. Just... There we go. Good morning. Um, Grace Marie mentioned uh, generic drugs. We were in Tampa, Florida at the end of 2006 to, to roll out the program, and I was standing with a retired police officer from Lawrence, Massachusetts, who he and his wife had moved to Tampa uh, to enjoy the weather, uh, and we looked at the preparations for our, our $4 generic drug announcement, and he said to me, there sure are a lot of guys from Walmart here today, and I said, yes, there are, but I'll be honest with you, we're a global company, but nothing really matters as much as what's happening here today. And he looked again and he said, well, maybe I won't have to cut my pills in half anymore. Um, and it was a rather profound moment for me to sort of see the face of, of older Americans who were struggling with their prescription drug cost. We, we moved into the generic drug space and, and I think it was, we did some transformative things in the healthcare world. And uh, now we're, we're, we're turning to healthier food, I think, in much the same way. Uh, about six miles north of here, the uh, Centers for Disease Control annual obesity conference is underway. Uh, it was the second story on Brian Williams this week, a big piece on obesity, the front page story the next morning in USA Today. So I think America is coming back to the wellness discussion. No matter how you look at health care reform, no matter where it goes from here, um, I think we're, we're coming back to sort of what's happening in wellness and, and personal responsibility issues. And whether it's Medicare or Medicaid or a large employer like us or uh, an insurance plan, the reality is it costs less for everybody uh, the, the better condition that the people in that plan are in. And I think that's the conversation um, that you're going to hear more of um, o over the next year or two. Uh, for Walmart, healthier food is a journey. It's, it's not a sprint. Uh, and um, food is complicated. Uh, I, it, I had lunch yesterday with someone, and we had a rather, rather philosophical discussion about the difference in this country, the evolution we went through on smoking, 
and the evolution we're headed into now on healthier food. Um, and there are some similarities and there are some vast differences, but, but uh, in some ways food is more complicated. Just to, I, I brought a couple of slides just to give you a sense of where we are. We have, besides the fact we have 140 million customers come through the, the front door each week, we have more than a million U.S. associates, 3,800 stores, 260 billion in U.S. sales last year. I think healthier food is a great fit with our core DNA of our company. The company was founded 50 years ago this summer. Um, Sam Walton from early on um, understood the need to manage costs for average Americans. Um, low prices probably matter more to people right now than they ever have before in the history of this country whether it is small towns in North Carolina or small towns in Arkansas or Birmingham, Alabama, we have a core customer that very much depends on us right now uh, in, in a tough economy. Um, I think what all of our customers and, and, and most Americans have in common right now, um, no matter where you come from, politically or family, everybody essentially wants one thing. You want your kids to have a better life than you did. It, when we talk to our customers, when we do research, when we explore what they're thinking, everybody wants their kid to have a better life. And, and many millions of families right now are stretching their budget and it's complex to achieve that. Um, so on food, and again, I'm, just, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these slides, um, People are hungry for good information about healthier food. They do have a desire to live better, and they're aware of food's role in health and the environment and what's going on in this country today. But the reality is they have limited time, they're on tight budgets, and they have multiple responsibilities. When you do research and say to our 140 million customers a week, we call our core customer mom. She has children, she has cho shopped us at least once in the past 30 days. But when you say to mom, you need to feed your kids healthier, the word you hear back is uh, that's slightly overwhelming because mom very often maybe has more than one job. Maybe she is or is not married. Maybe she has two to three children. She has a tough life. Um, and I always, when I come to Washington, am quick to remind people that there are folks in, again, those small towns in North Carolina and in Conway, Arkansas, and in Birmingham. They have a tough life. So it's not easy to assume that maybe she has the understanding of what it takes to eat healthier. January of 2011, um, we stood with the First Lady. We announced five core goals that we were going to reformulate packaged food. We were going to bring prices down. We were going to develop a front of package seal. Um, we were going to put more money through our foundation into charitable support for low-income nutrition education programs, and we were going to try to put more stores in food deserts. Uh, since then, uh, we have uh, reformulated thousands of foods. We're taking sugar, sodium, and trans fat out. We think we saved customers $1.1 billion last year by lowering prices on produce, and we are in the process right now of rolling out a relatively simple, easy to understand uh, seal on the front of, of healthier foods in our produce section, and it's coming this summer on our great value items. We put 23 new stores in food deserts last year, 50 to 60 more coming this year. Um, you have to be able to access healthy food to buy it. That's a pretty simple equation right now as we have this discussion. And we gave $13 million last year to some unique programs to um, help families understand what it means to eat healthier. Again, you can't say to people, oh, you need to go and eat healthier unless you're going to give them some tools to do that. Um, this is the icon that you'll start to see this summer. It's, it's rolling out right now. Um, we, we put together a tough criteria, um, and then we created algorithms, and we ran the contents of our products through this algorithm. And then if you, if you pass that, then the, you get the icon on your product. Um, the quote at the top of this page is a quote from Bill Simon, who runs our U.S. stores. No family should have to choose between food that is healthier for them and food they can afford. Fundamentally, that's what it comes down to for us. I think traditionally there has been a sometimes true, sometimes not true stereotype in the United States that if I ask you to eat healthier, that's more expensive. Um, and, and that is what we are working on changing that. And again, 
Um, Bill said it best when he, and this is sort of the mantra in many ways for what we're doing, no family should have to make that choice. And that's very important to us. Locally grown matters a lot to us. Um, I was just telling the Congresswoman I spent yesterday on a conference call. We have a great food distribution center in uh, North Carolina. We had a team come back from there last night and they said to me, man, those are some great employees. I mean, they're just a fabulous sort of work ethic. But in North Carolina, um, we buy from local farmers. They can be small, they can be medium, or they can be large. The food goes into the local food distribution center, and it's a much shorter supply chain from that uh, North Carolina field to the dinner table. Um, this means mom uh, feels much better about that shorter supply chain. Families like to feel that it was grown nearby, it has been touched less. Uh, but the other thing is locally grown means jobs. Don't ever forget in ag states that when you say let's really commit to locally grown, what you're really talking about in many ways is jobs. Um, again, we're doing unique things, I think, with some well-known nonprofits in the United States. We partnered with, with Sesame Street last year. We gave $2 million. Sesame Street created a character, and in some ways this is kind of sad, the sort of state of affairs, but Sesame Street set out to remind kids that if your family has to use the food pantry, that's okay, you're not alone. They, they set out to take some of the stigma out of, of what kids were dealing with. And it, it, I'll just close with, this is long term for us, we will be very transparent each year with the numbers reporting against our five promises. Um, food is complicated, uh, but I think as a, as a country, um, we're really coming back to the wellness discussion. I think it matters, and, and once again, I think you have to make healthier food easier for people to identify, find, shop, and take home and prepare for their family. Because if that happens, there's a whole slew of good things that happen with that. Families that sit down and eat dinner together tend to stay together. Uh, kids from those families tend to go to better colleges. There's this, a whole slew of good things associated with sort of what happened in families when I was a kid, and, and we're trying to bring some of that back. Thank you very much. It always is, you know, it really is it's so important to know what Walmart is, is focusing on because this really will lead to transformative change. They do a tremendous amount of research to find out what their employees and what their customers need and want. And they wanted, they did a lot of focus groups and said people wanted to eat healthier, they wanted to exercise, it just seemed overwhelming. They needed help. And that's really what Walmart is doing. So it's really a pleasure, Joe, to, to watch what you're doing. Uh, all of these slides, by the way, I see people taking notes. We're going to make all of these slides available on our website so you can have access to them later. Um, and I'd like to welcome to the panel Dr. Imran Andrabi, um, who I met several years ago talking about some of the transformative changes that he's been making in care delivery. Uh, he is Senior Vice President and Chief Physician Executive Officer of Mel Mercy Health Partners and a, singer, singer, a Senior Vice President for Clinical Innovation uh, with Catholic Health Partners. And with Mercy, he um, helps organize 200 physicians uh, employed with a physician group at Mercy and really trying to help them move forward with innovation and innovation care delivery systems to get to a faster, more efficient health sector. Uh, Dr. Andrabi, would you like to come to the podium? I think you have slides too, so welcome. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a family physician uh, who's practiced in the inner city area in Toledo, Ohio. Anybody know Toledo? <laughs> um, part of Catholic Health Partners, which is a not-for-profit Catholic health system in the state of Ohio. Um, and we have been in Toledo for the last 156 years. The first hospital that actually came into being, a safety net hospital, an academic hospital. So this was a, a chance for me to take all the frustrations that I have had as a, as a practicing physician over a period of time and, and talk about, you know, what are we going to be able to do in terms of making a difference in our community. And for us, this conversation or this journey actually started way before healthcare reform was actually born. 
Um, because for us, the conversation really was, how are we gonna continue to maintain our mission within our communities and help serve the communities that we have been serving for more than a century? And so we were seeing our community benefits going up from 72 million to 74 million to 84 million and on a trajectory to go up to $100 million. Whereas you all know what was happening in the external environment as far as reimbursements to physicians and hospital systems. And it was just not gonna be tenable. So we had to figure out a different way of doing things. What you see on the slide is really the understanding that if we continue to do what we were doing in the past, we knew we were not gonna be successful. So we had to radically change the way things were occurring within our, within our health system. We took the approach that let's start with our most complex organization, and if we could do it there, then we would be able to replicate that work to some of our other um, institutions within Catholic Health Partners. So, you know, Peter Drucker says, turbulent change does not scare me. Living by yesterday's rule in today's environment does scare me. And, and so, I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory with respect to what's on the horizon and what's coming down the pike for us and how we need to do things differently. So we had to get away from fragmented, silo-driven care. It was interesting, as a physician and then as a CEO of a hospital, I would go to the lab and I would ask them, how are you doing? And they would give me all these metrics and say, you know, we had 100% on everything. Then I would go to the emergency room and ask them the same question and they would give me the same answer. And then I would go to another place and they would give me the same answer. And then I would say, if you're all doing so well, how come the overall outcomes are not as good? So the, 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 the issue is how do we get away from this mentality of being silos to really coordinated systems that are taking care of the patients that we are um, blessed to take care of? How do we go from optimizing parts to really looking at the whole picture? And, and for many years, what we have been doing is using principles like Lean and Six Sigma, but what we do is we bring those folks in and say, well, let's go figure out how are going to, we are gonna improve the lab or how we are gonna improve the emergency room. But we don't look at it from a holistic perspective and say, patients don't just go to the emergency room. They don't just go to the x-ray department. They don't just go to physical therapy. They, they are being looked at holistically, so how are we gonna create a system that looks at them from their perspective. So moving away from anecdote, and we love to tell stories, and actually physicians are great at doing that, and I'm one of them. Uh, and when many, many of the times when you ask a physician about the story and when that occurred, it would be oh, four years ago something happened. So how do we move away from that to really looking at data and look, looking at information in real time that enables us to make quick decisions in, in order to improve systems? And going away from high uncertainty service delivery to being more predictable service performance within, within the organizations. So this is a, a graphic uh, that talks to us about you know, our patients that are within our hospital. And we actually did this work and mapped all of this out. We are great in terms of information systems. I mean, you look at the black bars in terms of knowing, well, we gave an IV antibiotic to a patient or an X-ray was done or a CT scan was, was created, those are the black bars. But we really have no information about what happens to a patient while they're in our institutions in between those times. And when we talk about that there is a significant amount of waste in healthcare, it was, it was our um, thought process that the waste really was not coming in at the black lines, the waste was really in the white space. And how could we improve our systems in such a way from a logistics perspective to enable our patients to have a better experience and at the same time reduce the waste in the system. So one of the things that we talked about is developing a system aim, which for us was patients first, journey to zero. And the patient first piece is pretty self-explanatory and, and a lot of people talk about that, but do we truly create systems that enable people at the front line like a nurse to be able to do what is best for the patient all the time. And the journey to zero is, let's take away all the rework. Let's take away all the defects from a quality perspective. Let's take away all the safety issues. Let's make sure that you don't have to do documentation here and documentation there and documentation there three times 
And, and that's all redundant work that not, neither creates value for the per person who's doing the work on the front lines or the patient who's there with you at that particular time. So we wanted to create flow for our patients. We wanted to create flow for our nurses and our physicians and the technology and the information that you needed to make decisions. We wanted to make sure that we were very high quality and very high safety at the same time. And we wanted to make sure that we create a completely coordinated hospital system. So let me give you a short story. As a part of my rounding, one day I went to the lab and I said, so tell me about how effective are you in terms of having labs ready for um, the patients in the morning? And this, they said to me, we are at 98% at 8 o'clock. Sounds like a great answer. Then I said, so tell me what time do the surgeons round in the morning? Any surgeons in the? Usually around 6, 6.30. So then I asked the question, I said, so how frequently do you have labs ready at 6.30 in the morning? Guess what the answer was? Zero percent. So you could look great on a metric at 98 percent at 8 o'clock, but it's really not relevant because you haven't really given anything to the to the patient, you haven't given anything to the nurse, you haven't given anything to the, to the physician to be able to be effective in terms of the work that they needed to, to do. So, they're just, just an example of, of how this works. We also partnered with a, with a, with a company called Care Logistics, um, a great partner in terms of an IT company that came alongside us in, with respect to developing human systems and then developing technology platforms that enable us to accelerate our work that we were doing in a manual format, and then enable us to also have analytics available to our folks in real time, so they could, what we call, learn and adjust. You had information in real time that you could do something about. A short um, uh, example. So we were great at sending reports out to our nurse managers, and I keep talking about the nurses because I do, this, I claim this all the time, that more than 50% of everything I know I learned from my nurses. Uh, so we would give information to our nurses and, and say, oh, six months ago you had three uh, patients on your floor that had blood clots in their legs. And then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it six months later? But if I had that information in real time, I actually could do something about it. So that's sort of the change in culture and mindset in terms of where we, we wanted to go. Um, this slide, don't try to read it, you will have it on the, uh, on the slide deck. But one of the principles was, it is no longer good enough to know what are your high level metrics within the organization. If you truly want people to be successful, they need to know what are the things that they need to be doing to be successful. So, for years, we've been talking about length of stay, for example, as a metric, and we keep going to people and saying, can you improve the length of stay of the patients? And people look at you and say, what are you talking about? So we actually boiled it down into, into smaller chunks, which we call the milestones, that people actually had some um, control over. We, so we said to a nurse, Would you, can you consistently start the first order sets that you get from a physician within one hour? every time, and the nurse could look at you and say, yeah, I can do that. And say, when you get the results back of a test, could you make sure that you communicate with the physician? You think you can do that? Oh, I, I have control over that, okay. So things like that. When you do those kinds of things that are simplistic in terms of the work that you have control over, then the high level metrics within the organization start moving. So that was sort of the principle behind the design. So what have we been able to see? Um, from, from the perspective of finances, this is just one hospital, and we are now in seven hospitals and, and moving within just our system, and care logistics as a system is actually um, in other hospitals. We actually saw a significant improvement in our finances by virtue of doing what was right for the patient, not because we were trying to make more money. I mean, that was important so that we could sustain our mission, but it was actually, if you don't have the mission, you don't have you know, the bottom line. We increased our core measure performance by 37%, and I, I'm still not happy with that. We need to be at 100% all the time. Uh, achieved a 49% reduction in infection rates of preventable harm. 
um, our DVTs fell by 38 percent, and this is 2010 data, so since then we've had another 50 percent reduction in this particular uh, metric. Very high patient satisfaction, which is very important from a value-based purchasing perspective. Our RN separation rate went down by 41 percent. We reduced preventable harm by 72 percent. That's huge. That's huge. It, it does the right thing for the patient and reduces cost to the system simultaneously. Improved our break-even census from 300 patients that needed to be in the bed to 231 patients. So now you could have fewer patients but still be able to finan be financially viable and actually created 110 virtual beds in the hospital. And what that means for a lot of the health systems out there they are trying to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on bed towers is that you can actually create another hospital within a hospital. And we saved $110 million of additional beds that could have been created within this hospital by doing this kind of work. So this is just sort of a, a, a glimpse of what we've been able to do. And from our perspective, we think we're only 25% of the way there. There's a whole lot more to come yet in terms of the work that we can do, not only just within our hospitals, but as a system overall. So I hope this is, is interesting and, and, and work that is meaningful. It's been very meaningful for me as a physician to see that we focus on the patients and the things that, that really matter um, from the perspective of people who are coming to us in the most vulnerable uh, times of their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andravi. We are delivering, I think, in our title of this panel, Innovation and Investments in Healthcare, to show the, the value of all of these transformative ideas. So thank you very much. And um, I, I'm, I'm abbreviating my introductions, of course, because the um, full, the full bio biographies of each one of our speakers, of course, are in our program. And um, this is probably a good time also to thank Jamie, Burke for the incredible work that she's done with the Galen Institute in helping us put together this panel. And Jenna Persico, who you met as you were coming in, and all of her amazing coordination of all the logistics, including putting together the program. Tara Persico, and also Ann Fitzgerald, who help us greatly at the Galen Institute. So I want to thank all of them. And as I do, yes, thank you. None of this would happen without their incredible expertise. And Dr. Michael Russell, I'd like to invite you to the podium. Uh, Dr. Russell is a um, practicing orthopedic surgeon, so there are, I know there are a number of surgeons in the room that really understood what you were talking about, Dr. Andrade, to, about the, the, the challenges to bring more efficiency to healthcare delivery. And one of the things that I have been most impressed with, and Dr. Andra, uh, Dr. Russell is the um, chairman of the board of directors of Physician Hospitals of America, who has, they really, to me, are a model for putting doctors in charge of medical care to doctors and nurses so that they can focus on quality care. And I believe they really are showing us what the healthcare of the future can look like, often with um, specialized targeted hospitals that, that specialize in one or another kinds of surgery often, but that also show us how they can use data to deliver care more efficiently, to get better care to patients, they have been particularly targeted in the health overhaul legislation. And I'd like to invite Dr. Russell to the podium to talk with you about that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And I also appreciate uh, the comments about early rounding because I am a surgeon. Oh, yeah. And uh, I do round very early, but I find that that's the best way to keep those length of stays low and, and get everything done. But I'm also going to tell you a story. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, as uh, Grace Marie said. Uh, I'm uh, uh, in a group of about 18 orthopedic surgeons with Azalea Orthopedics in Tyler, Texas. And we have every uh, subspecialty covered. We have um, hand surgeons and foot surgeons. We have joint surgeons, and I'm a spine surgeon. And I want to take you back to the year 2000. I'm going to tell a story, because we are pretty good at telling stories. And um, in the year 2000, I was the uh, chairman of the orthopedic section of one of our local not-for-profit, uh, large, traditional hospitals. And one of my colleagues came to me uh, with a problem. He was a joint surgeon, 
and he was being told by the, uh, the hospital that he could no longer do the uh, implant of his choice on Medicare patients. Specifically, he was being told that those surgeries were no longer profitable enough and that he was going to have to use what they called a DRG implant. And so this was untenable to him. I mean, basically, number one, uh, the implant of his choice was something that he was very familiar with. It w worked well in his hands, but also he felt very strongly that the other implant was of inferior quality. So we met with them. Um, I was the chairman of the, the section, like I said. We met with them, and they showed us this graph. It was a graph where the implant costs were here, reimbursement from Medicare was up here, and the fill in between was a very large overhead number. And they were showing us over time how those two lines were crossing and the hospital didn't feel that it could perform those procedures anymore. At about the same time, we were being very frustrated by the fact that there was incredible inefficiencies at the hospital. So our turnover times, and for you that don't understand exactly what we do, you know, I have a block at our hospital from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., let's say, and I can do a certain number of procedures that day, and it's all dependent on how efficient those nurses and, and the, the operations of the, the OR are. Specifically, at the time, our, our, our turnover times were about one hour long. So I could not do, as a spine surgeon, more than about three surgeries on a Monday there. So we felt very strongly that we were sort of at a crossroads. We, we could not see the future in the year 2000 being able to continue to take care of the patients like we felt we needed to do. And so through, uh, an, with another group in town, we decided to open an orthopedic uh, and uh, spine specialty hospital in the year 2010, I mean, excuse me, 2002. And the, the interesting thing was it wasn't easy. Quite frankly, uh, we invested $20 million to renovate an old Montgomery Wards building. And uh, after about six months of being open, uh, we weren't bringing in any revenue. Uh, we had hired a group of people to uh, run the business office because we knew enough that we didn't feel like we could run that, but they didn't know how to do it either. And so we were $5 million in the red after about eight months, and uh, it wasn't looking good. But through some tough decisions from uh, changing management, we were able to turn that around. Uh, and by the end of the first year, we were at least turning the corner. But more importantly for us as physicians, we figured out that we could do things more efficiently that turnover time, we were able to drop down from one hour to about 10 minutes. So for me as a spine surgeon, I could not only do three cases, but I could do five cases, and I could get home at three o'clock in the afternoon so I could go spend some time with my family. The second thing we were able to do was we were able to control those costs. Those implants that they told us they could not use, we were using. My joint surgeon was using the exact implants that they told him that was not available to him at that hospital. The third thing that we didn't really realize and we didn't really expect was we were able to vastly decrease our infections. Specifically, the national average for infections is somewhere between two and a half to three and a half percent for orthopedic procedures. And in the first year, we dropped that to 0.3 percent, 10 times less. And last year, it was 0.1 percent. So in 8,000 surgeries at our facility, we had eight infections. And that is huge for orthopedics. I mean, if you have a joint implant or you have a spine procedure and you have an infection, we're talking months of IV antibiotics, multiple procedures, hundreds of thousands of dollars per case in uh, cost. So it was really, really big. The other thing that we noticed is guess what happened with the traditional hospital that we were working at? Well, guess what? They found a way. Specifically, they have over the last five years dropped those turnover times down to about 20 minutes. And guess what? My joint surgeon, he still operates at that hospital and he still uses the implant of his choice because they learned how to control the costs of the implant so that they could compete with us. And that's what it's all about. And, and in fact, they're now opening a heart hospital that which they've gone to one of the physician owned hospitals in another state to learn how to do. So the truth is the data supports competition. In fact, in 2005, HHS came out with a study that showed when physician-owned hospitals come in to a market, they lower mortality and they lower infection rates, and that patients are three to five times less likely to experience a, com a complication once that competition happens. The quote from that study is, competition from physician-owned hospitals provides community hospitals with a stimulus for change, and that's the 2005 MedPAC study. 
If you look at other organizations such as health grades, consumer reports, uh, private companies that use the data from government, you find the same exact thing. In fact, physician-owned hospitals rank first in 20 states from consumer reports. And that's despite the fact that less than 5% of hospitals are physician-owned, and in fact, only 33 states allow physician ownership. And in places like Texas or Arkansas, where we have quite a few hospitals, you might find that eight to nine out of 10 of the top hospitals through consumer reports are physician-owned. So the third thing, even though you know, we have good quality, uh, we have good efficiency, uh, we have lower mortality and infection rate, but it also costs less. Uh, specifically, a study was done last year that showed that for Medicare patients, the government reimburses these hospitals $734 less per case. Add to that the fact that we have lower infection rates and we estimate that we save another $600 million for Medicare just in infection rate alone. So the question you have to ask yourself is why would anyone want to limit this type of competition? Well, in fact, that's exactly what, what Obamacare through Section 6001 did in March of 2010. And specifically at that time, there were 100 new hospitals in, on the drawing boards ready to, uh, to start construction, or some of them were in the middle of construction, that had to be stopped. An estimated of $2 billion worth of economic stimulus was halted in its tracks. 40,000 jobs were stopped. And uh, as an aside, these hospitals that are in existence right now pay $600 million worth of taxes. So for a hospital like my own in Tyler, Texas, we were ready to do a $40 million expansion. We were gonna double the size of our hospital. Uh, but we had to stop in our tracks after spending several million dollars on acquiring land and doing other things. So the truth is, healthcare reform should be about increasing access, lowering costs, and the higher quality that we can achieve. And we feel that we, as physician-owned hospitals, uh, are needed to be that stimulus for change when, when the change is needed in that community. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, well. Thank you, Dr. Russell. And I am just such a huge fan of physician-owned hospitals, and it is really criminal to me that this legislation has basically, is really trying to stop competition in the health sector. And as we've seen, that's really the future. And the future is also the theme you see here is we've got to listen to doctors and patients, listen to people on the front lines to figure out what we need to do to lead to this transformative change. So thank you all very much. There are plenty of seats up forward. You also, um, if you would like to find a chair the, up here. Um, we um, now have time for questions. So if you, we are being webcast. So if you would hold up your hand and wait for the microphone, and um, is ready to take your first question. Somebody be brave, and it's also if somebody, if you would tell us who you are and where you're from. Dr. Grinnells, I think, has a, Dr. Earl Grinnells from Baylor University, welcome. Uh, this question is for Joe Quinn. I teach um, MBA healthcare executive uh, students in a program that we have, and, um, their statement of no, no margin, no mission is, you know, I hear that repeated a lot. You didn't say anything about whether Walmart is making money making these changes that you talked about. I hope and presume you are, but, you know, profit and making money just means serving people's needs better. So I, that's my question. How much money are you going to make on doing these changes? Well, you know, you make a great point that I think often gets overlooked. I think people assume sometimes that what's good for America and what's good for business are, are different things. I, I think whether you're running a hospital in Toledo or building an orthopedic model for a physician's own hospital, what, what's good for the community is also good for business. I, I, those are not uh, exclusive things. But you, you make a great point that I think in discussions like this, often gets overlooked. I mean, in the, in the days when we were rolling out $4 generic drugs, we would remind people that even at $4, there was profit there. I mean, I think, and, and there's certainly profit in saying to 140 million customers a week that, you know, here, here are some healthier food options that we want to make available to you. And I think in, in many ways, it's simply about the numbers. I, I think the, the story about how many back procedures you can do in a day if you're more efficient, it's, it's about efficiencies and it's about, about your numbers. But yes, uh, you, you do make a point that's very often overlooked. Meryl. 
Merrill Matthews, Institute for Policy Innovation. Also, everybody has doctor, PhD doctor. Thank you, Grace Marie, and, and mine's for Joe also. Uh, you mentioned the food desert. Could you define what makes a food desert? How far does stores have to be, how much distance between stores before you can get you know, vegetables and fruits and things like that? And if there is a convenience store in the area uh, that has, say, fresh fruits but not fresh vegetables, is that, does that disqualify it from being something that uh, addresses the food desert aspect? We go by the United States Department of Agriculture map, and I, there's, a, I think, a rather complex criteria that goes into defining food deserts. So we, we use their map. Um, we're out there fairly aggressively right now, um, and I think we're also uh, reminding people, and I think this is another thing that Americans overlook a little bit, a, a food desert can be in a very rural area, and, and it can certainly be in an urban area. So we're out there in, in both of those uh, areas now, we, we go by, to your question, we go by the USDA map, um, and we think that that's a very significant issue. We're also, as a company, looking at different formats. You know, we've looked at some smaller formats in, in recent years. In, in Gentry, Arkansas, a small town, we, we, we opened a, a much smaller store last year to sort of see how that played. We're opening more neighborhood markets, which is our gro grocery-only model. Um, so a lot going on right now, and I, I think as people's uh, food shopping habits change. The question? Dr. Russell, um, maybe you could tell us, did I, did I see somebody's hand? Um, Dr. Russell, talk to us about, about the facilities that are actually under construction that you've had, I don't know if you had any photos we can show people, we'll put those on our website, of facilities that were, you know, millions of dollars invested in facilities that were not only bought the land, but also had gotten permits and approval, and the buildings nearly completed, but were not able to make it to the December 31st deadline to get those. Which, uh, I think probably the most stark um, example of that is in Nebraska. I think it was in Kearney, Nebraska, where there was a hospital. And in that, that uh, situation, Kearney is several hours, and I don't know Nebraska well enough to know where, but several hours away from the nearest larger city that has good medical uh, care. And they were part of the hospital there was part of an, a system-wide thing. So what happened was, was the system decided to pull the cardiac care out of that city. And so the cardiologists were there, and the, the city and the patients, and well, there was a need they felt that they needed to open their own hospital. And so they started back in around 2009 with a, a, a heart hospital, but it also had uh, general acute care as well. But unfortunately, they did not meet the deadline, and I think they've lost uh, you know, quite, a, quite a bit of money, and there's an empty shell of a building just sitting there. So um, there are other examples of that, but that's the most stark example. Yeah. And even more importantly, all the patients who needed that care who are exactly. not going to get that quality care. Congresswoman Elmers, I wonder if you can give us a sense of where you, th what you think the options are to solve this in Congress. Well, um, speaking especially to the physician-owned hospitals, it was an unfortunate um, uh, result of Obamacare that that those um, hospitals were basically put on hold, as you point out. I mean, just from a from an economical standpoint, from jobs for construction to the fact that there are patients who have gone without health care. You know, definitely serving the niche that that needs to be to be made, especially in some of those areas. Um, I was just mentioning to Grace Marie that, of course, during the payroll tax extension conference that we had, that was certainly one of the issues that we were trying and fighting so hard to keep in, so that we could at least for those hospitals that were under construction, that we would be able to move forward. And unfortunately, we were not able to do that. But that is definitely one of those areas that many of us in Congress understand, especially many of my colleagues who are from Texas, because the physician-owned hospitals are so prevalent in Texas. Um, that's definitely on the on the slate of, of uh, reforms that, that we would like to see move forward. Um, there again, the efficiency it speaks for itself, and certainly a model moving forward for good health care. Thank you. And Dr. Andrabi, I wonder if you could um, Talk to us a little bit about how you got physician buy-in, because I think that's always a real challenge, to, to make changes that um, need to be made for the efficiency of the institution and patient care, but they want to keep doing things the same way. How, how did you navigate that? It's actually not that bad. 
Um, so let, let me say this. Um, you know, you heard uh, Dr. Russell talk about the fact that, you know, physicians want to do the right thing. They want to take care of their patients. They want to be efficient. They want to have the time to be able to either go home and spend time with their families or be able to see additional patients that actually then helps the community too. So quite honestly, you know, and I still talk to our physicians and, and what they tell us is the work that we've been able to do up to this point, the physicians actually really appreciate it because it makes them more efficient, it gives them more time, it gives them the ability to either utilize that time with their family or by able to go see additional patients. It improves their quality because the systems are predictable and they, they now know what to expect. Uh, they do, no longer, and this happens quite a bit in many hospitals where a physician will say, my patients will only go to this floor and never put them on another floor because they cannot get consistent results throughout a organization. That doesn't happen anymore. They, they know when to expect a phone call from a nurse. They, they know what information is available. They are not looking for charts. They are not running around after patients. I mean, all that information is now available for the physician, so it makes it more efficient. And, and, and as a result of that, the buy-in comes because they know that you know, they are actually getting value out of the system that is being created that also, oh, by the way, produces better outcomes and results for their patients. Well, congratulations, because we know that's always really a huge challenge. Um, and Joe, just, just a little more background on Joe. He, when he was, um, before joining Walmart, he was director of policy for former governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee. And uh, they developed the Healthy Arkansas Initiative, which became Healthy America when Governor Huckabee became, became chairman of the, of the National Governors Association. And it, again, just, I sort of feel like we want to say to Joe, What's next? You know, after really bringing bringing these standards to um, to the country, and now and then four dollar prescription drugs, and and I think what we will see as a major national initiative to bring healthy food to people, that that really is part of a part of a seamless continuum in your career, and really having a vision for where we're going. What the question is, but I just feel that you're doing. Um, you really do have a, a sense of where we need to go. And I think that actually comes from listening to people in the focus groups that you do and what they're telling you about what the challenges are they're dealing with. Well, I, I, I just think I'm struck. I walk through our stores shopping, and I'm sure you do this back home. I love my Walmart and Dunn. We like to fill that basket for us. But, uh, you know, I, I just, to your point, I think the large point is that there, there are a lot of people out there who have a, a tough life. They're uh, worried about the economy. They are worried about their families. And we can't oversimplify when we say to them, you need to do healthier things. You have to give people tools to do that. You have to do that at an affordable price. You have to integrate that into the larger discussion in this country of all our health care. And it, there, are some, there are some complex issues there, but I think we all can't make the assumption that it's easy just to say this to people and change will follow. I think we're living in a unique time, and I think sometimes, and when you're home, it, it, what you find in a parking lot in a Walmart on a Saturday morning in a small town in North Carolina where the Girl Scouts are selling their cookies, is it's a long way from here. You know, I would just, um, one last comment that I would like to make um, as far as savings and innovation and, and moving forward into healthcare, um, I would just like to touch on um, malpractice tort reform. Um, one of the things that we were able to pass um, in HR 5, which is repeal of the Independent Payment Advisory Board in the healthcare plan, we also had some meaningful tort reform moving forward, um, putting a cap on punitive damages and things like that. And there again, that has that went through the process. So we we are knowing 
it full well that that is a savings in health care. We know that physicians, um, when, we're, when we're talking about savings and how physicians react and are acting, that many physicians do practice defensive medicine. And that adds to the cost. Why? Because you're scheduling more tests than, than you know, rather than sit back on the, the great knowledge that you've accumulated in your practice and in your education, you're doing more so that you're covering yourself. And we understand that. Emergencies room do, do that and every physician does that. So we know that there are billions of dollars worth of savings that will come as a result of meaningful tort reform and will be, again, a solid piece of reform moving forward. Thank you very much. You never know which microphone we're going to be speaking from. Um, do we have time for one last question? Well, then, would you please? Oh, yes, okay, so go ahead. Um, we have the microphone over here, over on the left. Please tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Harmi Dillon, and I'm with the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, my question goes uh, along with Dr. Andrabi said about. Um, on your slides, I saw a figure that said increased productivity, and with that, there was cost savings. Um, how do you measure uh, increased productivity but still maintain quality for patients? And is there a metric that you, that you look at when you, uh, you know, it, it, if there's increased productivity for a patient, but that patient comes into the hospital multiple times after having a procedure, that doesn't save, that, that might add to cost. So how does, what's the balance between productivity and quality? That's a great question. Uh, very insightful. Thank you for asking that. Um, you know, we have traditionally um, looked at productivity in healthcare in terms of worked hours per unit of work or dollars per unit of work. And I think the way you have to look at productivity is the entirety of what happens within the hospital. So what is happening to your quality outcomes? What's happening to patient safety? What's happening to your readmission rate? So, what I didn't talk to you about is that as we were reducing our length of stay, our seven-day readmission went down from 8% to 1%. And our 30-day readmission went down by 5% at the same time. So truly, it's a different way of looking at productivity, uh, not necessarily the way we have traditionally done it, but looking at what are the outcomes that are being produced by the individuals at the front line, rather than counting hours of work that are being produced. Thank you. I think please join me in thanking our panel Incentives and Investments in Healthcare. A fabulous job. Thank you all very much. Thank you.